to our uh, monthly brown bag lecture series here at the Kearney Public Library. Uh, the history department hosts these lectures in conjunction with the Kearney Public Library and we're always very, very happy um, for the, the uh, hospitality that the library shows us for these presentations. Um, before I introduce uh, today's speaker, who really doesn't need much of an introduction, um, I want to uh, point you to the upcoming talks that we're having in the series. Uh, so next month on May 8th, I will be talking about Stephen D. Richards, who as far as we know is the only serial killer who was active in Buffalo County. <laughs> we hope, hope that, yeah. Uh, so the Crimes and Times of Stephen D. Richards uh, will, will be uh, May 8th. Um, June 12th, uh, Dr. Amber Alexander will be presenting uh, her research on uh, Nebraska Army airfields during the Second World War. Um, and then in July, um, it, I, it will be me again, um, the stratospheric rise and explosive fall of the Explorer One balloon, um, which is part of the centennial commemoration um, that the Phelps County Historical Society is having for uh, the Explorer One balloon, which was a National Geographic and Army Air Corps balloon that, that uh, detonated and crashed outside Loomis in July of 1934. Um, please stay in touch. There's a sign-up sheet uh, to get on the events email for the history department. Uh, we have a wide variety of programming, both on campus, uh, throughout Nebraska, and then, and then here at the library. And so we'd like to, to let you know about what we're doing, what our students are doing. Um, if you um, haven't seen already, we also have, um, there's a QR code in the back uh, to help support our students. Brock is uh, one of our former uh, graduate students and now, now a dear friend and colleague um, and member of our department, but we, we, any support for our students who are conducting research, community engagement, and other things is, is very, very appreciative. And so uh, that information is at the back table as well. Um, but our talk today, our, our speaker is, is Brock Anderson, who is originally from Alliance, Nebraska. Uh, Brock is an enrolled member of the uh, Oglala Sioux tribe at the Pine Ridge uh, Indian Reservation. In his professional background, he graduated from Shadron State College with a bachelor's degree in social science education in 2017, and then completed his master's degree in history at the University of Nebraska Kearney in 2022. Um, he has been the community engagement director for the Buffalo County Historical Society, also the, the Trails and Rails Museum since uh, August of 2019, and also is an adjunct instructor both for Shadron State and for, for UNK. He serves on multiple boards um, throughout the state of Nebraska, the cultural and historical institutions, including the, the Mari Sandos Heritage Society. He is also uh, a previous Mari Sandos uh, scholar for the Mari Sandos Heritage Society. Uh, the, the State Historical Preservation Office, based out of Pittsburgh, Nebraska, and the Kearney Public Library Foundation. As a researcher, Brock explores Native and non-Native relationships and the interactions in Western Nebraska, as well as work within Native American and Lakota culture based around repatriation, which is part of what we're going to be discussing today. So let's welcome Brock. Can you hear me? Not yet. No. Okay, how about now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, hopefully I didn't screw this up in a matter of five minutes, but I have it. Um, I think I need to do one more little plug. Actually, I've got two more little plugs I need to do. So there is a Celebrate National Poetry Month with the Kearney Public Library that starts, yesterday. Oh, it started yesterday. Um, and on Thursday, April 18th at 12 p.m., there's a poetry writing workshop with Nebraska State Poet Matt Mason. There's a lot going on throughout the month of April. I see there's this amazing flyer. Christy, is there one on the back? Yeah, there should be okay. some on that back. Perfect, so, so make sure you look, look at that, grab one on the way out, whatever it may be. So take a look at that and then we also have our fabulous Friday programs at the Trails and Rails Museum. So the brown bag lecture is always the second Wednesday of every month at noon. Well, you can do two in one week if you remember to do the fabulous Friday, and that's always the second Friday of every month at 2 p.m. So a lot of twos with the fabulous Friday here. Okay. Um, and today's program is going to be a little bit different compared to maybe some of the other brown bag lectures that you've seen. There is definitely that academic part, that research part that is so focused that, that, that so many of these historians like Nathan and Chris and Linda that they all bring, but there's also this very more personal journey that I got to be a part of that will come out in this story 
about this thing called the red shirt winner tax. Okay, so are we ready? Yes. Give me a thumbs up so I can go to sleep. Oh, okay. <laughs> so what is a winter calendar? In short, it's the Lakota calendar. And really, to, to best describe in the most simplest way possible, the Lakota calendar isn't like a, a, a Gregorian calendar. It's more based from first snow to first snow. So when we talk about certain events, people, places, in the various Suian speaking people that are on the Northern Great Plains, we're talking about a, a not so much a day and time in, in the sense of how we think about it, but rather based on seasons. And what events that take place during those seasons that define such a critical part of the Lakota history. And so this is one example of a winter count. And so when you're looking at a winter count such as this one, there's going to be someone that is considered the historian or the person that keeps track of how this is written down or how this was remember. So we have what's called a winter count keeper. Oral tradition, oral stories, <coughs> definitely one of those major components of the Lakota speaking people. This is more of a reference tool and a teaching tool that is laid out every so often throughout the years and used as a tool to remember certain people, places, and events that are defining moments for a, a tribe or a tiochie or a family clan that is associated with that winter count or that group count. So for example, if we were to talk about when, let's say, Black Elk was born, the reference wouldn't necessarily be to a specific year, but rather a certain season or event such as when Winter when the four crows were killed on the Tongue River. So if you ever read John Neihart, that is when Black Elk is credited to have been born. This specific winter count that we're going to be talking about today is the Bad Peace Good or Brown Hat winter count. It's a lot more than, again, these drawings. It's these, it's these written down oral histories and oral traditions that are then passed down to family members within the Tiaxia. So it would, whether it be nephews or some other male figure that's going to have a prominent role within a group of, 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 of the Lakota tribe. And so you can see very early on how some of these, these accounts are written down. Now granted, you're gonna see years associated with that. And we're gonna get into a little bit more why that is the case, because traditional, winter counts, they were written out from the center and into a spiral all along the family. And some of them, even on the tiki themselves, where the winter count keeper actually lives. Brown half, he was born uh, the year of the comet streaked across the sky. Oftentimes you'll see it among other um, winter count keepers, other tribes within the region, like the Rosebud, that um, it made a large, a loud sound of some sort when it went across the sky. So, but the key part is, is when this star or this comet streaked across the sky in 1821 or 1822. So the early parts of 1822 could also be part of, of, of the actual year, despite the fact that we have it as a singular 1711, 1712, 1713. And Brown Hat, He's a key part of this longevity of what's called the good winter count. Large in part, again, there's not just one form of winter count, there are many. As you can see, the Betty's Good has about the longest written tradition of a winter count compared to more of the other ones. Betty's Good, when he was up on the uh, Rosebud Reservation, um, just in the south and west, we have what was called Camp Sheridan. That was there, it's just 
north and east of Fort Robinson, um, but kind of by Hay Springs, Nebraska. And when um, a, a, a local uh, assistant to the Surgeon General, um, get a little up to my slide, I'm sure we'll come back. Oh no. Okay, so when ultimately one of these assistant uh, Surgeon Generals were at Camp Sherry, his name was William Corbett here, who um, had an interest in a lot of this Lakota history up on Pine Ridge and the Rosebud Reservation out of Camp Sheridan. And so part of what he had done is he had actively went out and started collecting some of these stories from the Sakanju and the Lakota people, or the Oglala. And so he would go up to the reservation um, and talk to certain people, winter camp keepers, as they are the historians of the, the local tribe, and get some of their history that they can, then can report back to Washington, D.C., and come up with a better game plan strategy to way to um, relocate, to um, connect with these people. But what it does on the opposite side, for Brown Hat, it sparks a key curiosity and a key interest of, of when, the, from the moment he was born in 1821, he had always known that he had come from a family of winter count keepers. And he had used what would be his father's winter count and kept that going, but also built upon some of previous history that he could tie into from various kiosques that were nearby. So the Betis good winter count actually dates back to the 1700s. And even then, even further back with the creation story of the Lakota people. And so, as you see, with the good winter count, there's a distinct style that is drawn in depicting various events in those years compared to the American horse winter count or the long soldier winter count. Notice, again, dates that are not associated with William Corbier is the one that's going to be the, the person that's going to put together a lot more of these years associated with the pictograph, defining that specific year. And so again, some very specific drawings here that comes from this, this winter count. I'm not gonna actually show you any pictures of the one that was discovered, rediscovered at the Sheridan County Historical Society at the wishes of the family until they have become more public with, with some of those images. But we have, again, a long history, 100 and some odd plus years of, of images that are, are well documented that they're in the Smithsonian and other places across the United States. And when we interpret some of these images, some of them you can pick up pretty quickly, right? So if we're looking at this person here, some of you might say, what? Small pox. Yeah, smallpox, measles, something along those lines. And yes, absolutely. That year and that winter, it was specifically um, a hard year where many people died within the Tiafchie from smallpox. Another one, first glance, what do we see? Yeah, or an American flag. We see an American flag. Stars and stripes. And then for whatever reason, circled around. And so you can take some of these first glances at some of these images and maybe get somewhat of a decent idea. But another key part to this, this um, interpretation that takes place requires a, a knowledge, a dialect, of the Lakota language. Because some of these symbiotic terms and dialects that maybe we'd miss out on, like whatever's going on here, would have maybe a greater meaning to this flag that is in the middle of it all. 1792, <coughs> this is a white woman. First encounter with a white woman. And then we also have the year of um, a great chief that had passed away. 
1797. And some of those indicators that we'll see, the arrow, some sort of combat happening here. And again, this is going to require knowledge of the language itself. So for example, we all know what the Pawnee are known for, right? Especially as of recent, what they've been able to do in the state of Nebraska with their corn. The symbol of Pawnee corn and the fighting that would take place is also very much so re recollected among this winter count. And even then, this uh, uh, assistant surgeon general at Camp Sheridan, he's adding other notes to this as well, along with Betsy Scooter Brown. To the point where from these oral histories and oral traditions, it was recorded that six Pawnee had died. Um, in 1799, we see there is, again, he's got an arrow, but it's not hitting any one person. Instead, it's pointing up towards where? The sky. And so whatever, again, whatever's happening here, this is, I'm not a, a, a fluent Lakota speaker, but this is a symbol for a lot of childbirth loss that had happened in 1799. And then in 1878, we see a horse, a person, and a gun. And that's a key event that happens all along the Northern Great Plains, the Sioux people, where Crazy Horse is killed. And you'll see in a lot of different winter counts, whether it be the American Horse Winter Count or the Long Soldier Winter Count, there are some of these shared events that are mentioned in these various historical recollections and oral traditions that are passed down and written down. But that one major shared event that allows scholars outside of Lakota culture, but in conjunction with them, is this, this massive meteor shower that happens in 1833. Also coined as the year the stars fell, named after the book that um, Dr. Candace Green and Russell Thornton had, had composed and Christina White that had also had a major part of it. And so using this as the basis, as the basis for, to start where, you know, again, we have the Betsy Scud says 1834, and piecing some of these other ones, we can then say, okay, so this is the timeline of what we have going here in terms of the flame winter count, the lone dog winter count, the lone long soldier winter count, the American horse. So we can start now identifying what years some of these winter counts are describing outside of the Lakota culture. Okay, so that's that's your 101 of winter counts. And I maybe just confused you a lot more because as, as I'm getting ready to talk about some of the personal aspects, we have this thing called NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act of 1990. And so when we're talking about various Native American items, ceremonial pieces, or cultural items, kind of have to be careful. There's some pieces legally that you cannot own as an individual or as a federally recognized institu institution like the library or BCHS that has to be returned or repatriated back to the various native peoples that it came from. And so what that all includes is still kind of a big question mark because NAGPRA in all reality, it's an important document and it's spurred this change in our American culture to return things that have been taken illegally or taken um, under, under, under hostage, it's very difficult to, to um, enforce. It has been 
largely unenforced in the history of the last 20, 30 years that it's been a law. And so what it specifically looks at are, are the graves and the items that came from these graves that, that grave robbing took place uh, so many years in the late 19th century and early um, 20th century. So specifically looking at burial sites, whether it be above ground or in the ground or any of these other human remains that museums or other institutions have collected as part of their collections or artifacts or items, those items have to be at least consulted with the various native groups, native groups that where they had come from, that they're represented, and they either have to be returned or honored in some way, shape, or form differently than if they've done in the past. As far as cultural affiliation, um, there comes this part where um, we have we see these. Um, let me turn that side off. Let's go jump down to the cultural items. Okay, this is where it really gets kind of messy because this is where the, the least defined part becomes problematic for museums really across the United States. So again, focusing on funerary objects, but we also see this ceremonial aspect that is specific to the present day. Um, so for example, um, needed for traditional Native American religious leads to the practice of traditional Native American religions or their present day adherents. So whether it be like an eagle staff or these other materials that are needed for ceremonial practices that's going to fall under NAGPRA. Again, bone, this other element of cultural patrimony, it has an ongoing historical, traditional, or cultural importance central to Native American group or culture itself. That again is very broad and that's hard to, do, to define. And even then, it's been redefined over several years, most recently, just this last December. And so NAGPRA, in its, in its current state, seeks to strengthen more authority and roles of tribes in the repatriation process. When it was first established in 1990, it was more the federal government pushing these museums and entities to return these items. Now comes this part where native organizations, native tribes, native reservations are a key part in that process. Um, the other dynamic here, since December of 23, museums and other federal agencies must contact and obtain permission from applicable tribes or their lineal descendants before exhibiting or access or researching any of these other human remains or cultural items that exist in within the, the, the museum institution. And that's a big one. Otherwise, um, you're breaking federal law. Um, there's also this weird category where we don't know culturally where a, a, such a person's um, human remains have come from that, that make it ineligible for NAGPRA. And that ultimately is eliminated in 20. There is also this effort to increase transparency and reporting of existing collections. Um, and then of course, there's a timeline. We have five years to, to go about this in a way that would be um, within the right regulations of, of, of the federal law. And ultimately, the goals of, of NAGPRA then, and even more so now, is more indigenous knowledge, to have these lineal descendants involved, and getting these tribes back, uh, getting these pieces back to some of these reservations to where they're derived from. And so, oh, there's that slide. <laughs> and so this leads me to some of more of this, this personal story that I like to tell and talk about so much. So again, I'm from Alliance, but I have family spread out all across the Panhandle. Um, one of those towns is Gordon. And that is just to the east of Rushville, about 15, 20 miles. And as I was working on my master's thesis during the COVID pandemic, which I don't recommend, <laughs> a lot of institutions and archives are closed at that time, 
especially like the State Historical Society. But I could get into the, these smaller town museums that have these archives, these collections, that, that haven't necessarily been consulted as much. And so it's June 2021. I'm finishing up some research, and I'm going through um, the Sheridan County Historical Society archives for the sixth or seventh time and always finding something new one way or another, or one of the volunteers like, hey, Pat, did you see this? I found this in such and such room and such and such time. I'm like, no. And so I would then make a distinct effort to put all these things back in one spot, okay? And so as I'm digging around, I have keys to the museum up there in Rushville, and I can come and go and do whatever I need. I found this little envelope. <coughs> this pink envelope that's no bigger than the size of my hand. And so I approach Phyllis, who is the, the volunteer that I've been working with, and I ask, what is this? And she, um, it was buried underneath all of the files in the filing cabinet. At the bottom of all of their Native American files, I had just pulled them all out and continuing to search, and in the far way back. And she said, oh, I don't know, I haven't seen that before. <laughs> and so as we continued examining it, I opened up the little, the little pink envelope and found that this was a ledger from the 1870s. And so that was pretty cool to begin with. See some prices of, um, from a business in, in Rushville at that, um, various costs and people that owed money. But then once you get to the middle, you see pretty much these drawings. At that point, you're asking questions. Who had done this? Where did it come from? What does this mean? All of those historical questions that everybody should be asking. And so we open this, and then we look at the envelope in more close detail. And since I'm young and I didn't really practice a whole lot of uh, cursive in school, you know, because I don't teach that anymore and it's all computerized, I had to ask Phyllis for some help. And ultimately, we realized what we had. It said, contents of Indian calendar by Chief Redshirt, donated by Winnie Redshirt. And at that point, that's when my jaw hit the floor. I had no idea that something like this even existed. And quite frankly, if I'm being honest, I didn't know what a winter count was, or to what extent it, what it was. And so at that point, I was given the task by the Sheridan County Historical Society. Again, I have keys. I had my keys on me. I rattled them so I shouldn't be here. But I had keys to the museum there. And Phyllis, at that point, um, had agreed to allow me to be the steward of this object and figure out what would be the best option to do with it. So I took it back with me to Carney. I didn't have my nice big scanner that I would take. I took some pictures. I, I, got to Gordon, I didn't have anything to transport it with. And so I'm looking around in my mom's house and I'm like, gosh, what can I take this with? I ended up with a Pop-Tart box. <laughs> a little bit more protective. And I put it right up in the front seat so that way it didn't leave my sight the whole time. After digging around about who this Lakota chief was, red shirt, very prominent figure, he was um, a, a, a very well-respected um, leader on the Pine Ridge Reservation. In fact, there is a red shirt table that's named after him and his family. There's a community called Red Shirt on Pine Ridge. He was involved with a lot of the Wild West shows with Buffalo Bill. Um, even then, his distinct hair and part of his persona. We have this professional side to, to red shirt here, but then we also have this other side and his hair specifically that he talked about that he was ready for war. Um, this is a much older picture of, of red shirt. He's actually got a um, Ulysses, Ulysses Grant peace medal that he received. He was, um, you know, he was one of those folks that had gone with these various delegations to Washington, D.C. to advocate for the Pine Ridge Reservation for the Lakota people. He made frequent visits to Carlisle Indian School 
and wanted updates on what was happening there. So a very well-respected leader among the Lakota people and among his fiatshua. And so we get, I have all this research. I'm contacting people at the Smithsonian. I'm reaching out to people in California. I'm talking to people in Pine Ridge. And I'm trying to find out more information. I have so many more questions. And I'm trying to find if there are any living and ultimately, at a um, DCHS event where we invited Kurt Hackamer down to the University of South Dakota in Vermilion, he had done a program for BCHS at the Merriman Performing Arts. Maybe some of you remember that a few years ago. And so as a grad student and just a, a nice host, we went out to the Thunderhead Brewery just here in town. And he asked, what's your project? What do you got going on? Every historian's got like five projects in their back pocket they're working on, right? And so I tell them about this, this little winter town, and what my struggles are with it at this point in time, and his face just turns white. He had been working with Megan Redshirt Shaw up at University of South Dakota <coughs> and knew of the Redshirt family, none of them of which are living in Pine Ridge or the Rosebud Reservation today. They all, they all live in California or on the eastern part of South Dakota. So at that point, we connected. This was my, my connection, and I knew at this point, whatever happened to this winter count, wherever it may be or what is ever to be done with it, it was to happen through the family, okay? And so I get in contact with Delphine. Delphine Redshirt is a professor at the University of Stanford. Um, she's, she's got a language component to her, her um, research. And so we met at, um, in Omaha at a little coffee shop. They had gone to a concert the previous night before. And I got to meet both Megan and Kirsten. There was another, there's another brother in there that um, did not make the trip. And then even then, uh, Delphine's husband, Richard Shaw, is a... Uh, on the East Coast teaching at Yale. So um, very, very much so a, a family that's kind of spread out all over the country. And so at that point, the Redshirt family, myself, and the Sheridan County Historical Society, we started having some discussions about what this thing was, what should happen with it. And ultimately, <coughs> it was decided that from the story that we were told with Winnie Redshirt donating to the Sheridan County Historical Society, Society, where they were moving to Pine Ridge after a big fire that had taken place, that Sheridan County Historical Society had been the stewards of this, this document long enough, and that it needed to go back to the family to where they can then share it with the rest of the world. And so currently, it is at the Stanford um, Green H.C. Cecile Library, <coughs> where it's going to go under further digitization digitization and appraisal. Because again, all our facts in our <coughs> collection, um, there's a value to it. And even then, assigning a value to something like this, it's a challenge. Um, when we officially repatriated it back to the Redshirt family, we had a big old to-do about it. We had um, Delphine is actually born and raised in Gordon. And so she hadn't been back to Gordon in probably 30 plus years. And so as she described, it felt like a coming back ceremony for her to, to not only honor her family and honor her time there in Gordon, but also to take a piece of it with her and honor that legacy and that history that comes from her family. So we did a, a, a winter count. She had done a winter count presentation at Gordon Rushville High School and to there, we went to um, the Sheridan County Historical Society. They have a little history center um, just off the, the highway there to where we officially um, built, gave that back to the family. We enclosed it in a lot better than a Pop-Tart box, I would say. <laughs> it was an acid-free box tied together with some, um, some string, so it preserved and helped with that further transportation that it had to go. Okay. 
Um, so that process is still underway. And again, at the request of the family, I, I, I cannot show you any images. It's very cool. Um, but the real value of what this winter count does, again, going back to the longevity of this winter count. Again, back to 1700, I'd argue a little bit more with the creation story, but it stopped. That's 1878, 1879. The redshirt family being lineal descendant of brown hat and then high hawk, then took that, that specific winter count in this little ledger book and added about 40 more years to it than the family had ever known, that anyone else around the country had ever known. So from, from this winter count here specifically, we see a very much so complete history of, of, of the Lakota people, specifically of, of the, the Bassies Good winter count that um, it describes. And from here, my relationship with the Redshirt family is enveloped. Um, I've been since asked to be uh, an adopted member of their, of their Teoxie. I'm, I'm considered the adopted family member of the Redshirt family. And from there, um, we are, we've done several programs, one of which at USD and Vermilion, um, in front of a crowd of about 60, 70 people to where I shared kind of some of my experiences with this winter count, as well as what Delphine's experiences were with this winter count, and how repatriation is still an ongoing process, even in the 21st century, despite NAGPRA being a, a federal policy that is supposed to be adhered by any public institution that receives federal funding. And so the plan, is that once this is all digitized and opened up and um, the Lakota people can have more access to this, um, Delphine, myself, Megan, and several others, our goal is to go around and speak more about to the, the level of what it means to return some of these culturally significant items. And so, again, um, I can't speak to enough, I, again, I'm not, I'm not the winter count keeper expert. I don't know enough about all the history of, of this specific winter count itself, but I got to be part of the story. And I get to be part of that family's story and be part of this, this movement of, of returning items back to native people. And even then, again, I'm overwhelmed. I haven't been able to, and I, I don't have any of those shared experiences with some of the people that live on Pine Ridge. I know family members that are up there, but I don't have that, and I have this, this, this empty part of my soul, I feel like, where there's this cultural part that has been missing for so long that I can then begin and have begun this process in conjunction with the Redshirt family. So, otherwise, I know that was a short brown bag, but I don't wanna, I see a few people nodding off, so. <laughs> Thank you both, and I'm going to open it up for questions. I was wondering, the lady that donated at Winnie, how is she related to Delphine? I tried packing a lot into this presentation, and I can definitely clarify a few things, but Winnie Redshirt is the mother of Delphine. Okay. And so Winnie, um, her husband, and Delphine, and her siblings, had lived in Gordon for about 16 years. And so at the time when, when they were living in Gordon, there was a judge by the name of Clarence Ben Scoder who was forming the Sheridan County Historical Society and was actively collecting and seeking materials for the museum in Rushville that's called the Armstrong House. And so um, Delphine credits her mother for donating this winter count to the museum in Rushville because of a, a later house fire that would take place and to where they lost everything. So whether it be some sort of, what Delphine would say, spiritual motivation to donate this winter count to the museum in Rushville that would then come back to the family later on, later in their lifetime. So Winnie is, and there's even a great book 
about Winnie Redshirt. Um, Turtle, if you look up Delphine Redshirt's name, it's one of her more popular books. So, yeah. Can you or would you care to share what Delphine's reaction was when you two first met? <laughs> she cried. <laughs> And you know, I, I'm this guy that's nervous. I'm, I'm a nervous person. I don't know if you know this about me. But I'm this nervous Nelly. I drove from Kearney to Omaha the whole time, like, okay, this family's gonna be really mad at me that I've got this just in my ja jacket pocket here. Or what is their reaction going to be? I had already had maybe one or two conversations, and they lasted about an hour long each. And so I get there to this coffee shop. They're all sitting around. Um, uh, at, at this table, and I finally get to them, and my first thing I say, you want to see something cool? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so anyway, I pull it out of my jacket pocket, and I open it up, and instantly Delphine starts crying, because of how much that means to her family. And from there, we had a two hour long conversation about her work, the winter count, my work, and the future of, of, of this. Yeah? Has she seen it as, as a child? No. She has no recollection of it. And even then, they had always heard about the red shirt family being involved with the brown hat winter count, but it stopped at High Hawk, which would have been, I want to say, a someone within the Kyokushie, a, a, a great uncle, or whoever it may be. But this confirmed that with three winter count keepers within this, this ledger, it's, it's, there's three different people actively working on it, that, that their great-grandfather, Chief Redshirt, had an active participation in it. And oddly enough, it ends in 1922, actually the, the year is written out, and he died later on in 1922, February, I believe. Yeah? It can't really serve any kind of historical society to get someone else involved. Though. No. I thought they had a ledger. They, and even then, this Did probably you put in. Place? So the Sheridan County Historical Society didn't know what they had, is what was said in the front. Okay. Absolutely, they did not. And even then, um, this is, again, a, a community of 900 people, a museum that has been started and continues without any paid staff members. Oftentimes, you see a lot of these small county historical societies throughout Nebraska and the Great Plains region where you see these communities. Um, they're led by teachers. They're led by other professionals in the community that is not within the museum culture, but rather like-minded people that just want to support local history. And so this, again, they were gonna actually get into this from that filing cabinet out, and found this very much so underneath everything of those files um, down below. So luckily we, uh, we found all of that information. And even then, um, I had Jerry, the, the president of the museum, go back out there and look for me one more time just to make sure I knew that, that there wasn't anything else hiding underneath. So this was done in a ledger book that belonged to a business that kept their records. Mm -hmm. For so many years, till the book was full. They're not even the book's not even full. It's not even full. There's maybe full, about whatever. five pages. Okay, five pages that are written on. Mm -hmm. So are the drawings done mm -hmm. on top of the writing? They're done on the blank pages. Mm -hmm. And is there uh, like one winter count drawing on each page, or? In a traditional in a traditional winter count, wouldn't it be like on a hide and like you said, in a spiral? Yep. Uh, that would be the 1700s, 1800s, right? Yep. But this was done in a. Uh, so is that a photo of? Not of that oh, one not, specifically. Not of that one. Okay. This is one I believe is in the Smithsonian so collection. So it looks uh, it looks as though uh, there are what uh, eight or ten years on a page. Yep. So is that how it is on the, the red shirt ledger book? Yes, it is. And that's because of that early relationship between Baptiste Good or Brown Hunt and this, um, this assistant army general surgeon yeah. that was at Camp Sheridan who 
went up to the Rosebud Reservation because, again, Brown Hat was Sikandu. Sikandu or Brule. Some of you might know Brule. Um, but he went up there, got some of these oral histories from Brown Hat to where he brought and incorporated some of these dates and some of these other notes that he added on where to which Brown Hat continued that same style, as well as the Hi Hawk and Red Shirt family, and went further back past the early 1800s, all the way back to 1700 and beyond towards creation story. A second unrelated question. Uh, did you say there was a fort or a camp? Camp uh, Sheridan. Camp Sheridan, and that is north of Hay Springs? North of Hay Springs. Any remnants of that camp? Do you yes. know anything about that? Uh, very little, but there's signs and markers for it. Was that a military camp? Yes, it was. <coughs> um, when to what uh, year? You're looking at, so Pine Ridge was formed in 1879, um, and it would have been before that. So it would have been 1870 to 1877, 1878, so seven, eight years. So that would be. And even then, they go to and relocate to Fort Niobrara. Oh. So you think of Fort Robinson overseeing Red Cloud Agency <laughs> prior to Pine Ridge. Camp Sheridan was the same way for Spotted Tail Agency that was just north, just to the east of that. So the US military was actively there trying to maintain settlers from crossing into the reservation, but also keeping an eye on the Lakota and any kind of, any kind of uprisings that so was Camp Sheridan overseen by Fort Robinson? Is that correct? Fort Laramie. Oh, Fort Camp Laramie. Robinson and Camp Sheridan okay. is what they were originally. Fort. And they were, I, I would call them satellite camps. Right. To Fort Laramie. So that uh, Sheridan would have been uh, in pretty close proximity to Windy Knee. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And even then, it wasn't around when Windy Knee happened. Oh. Other questions? Yeah. That's a good question. One, we have, again, the Baptiste Good winter camp that has the associated years very early on in this relationship between William Cor Corbier, and then we have this singular event that takes place that is documented, documented as the latest, and I know I'm going to keep asking that, meteor storm that took place in 1834. And Skies were clear that evening on the northern Great Plains, and it's very well documented among various peoples all across South Dakota, North Dakota, parts of Nebraska, Wyoming, Montana. And the symbolism, and this could serve as a basis, as a starting point in identifying the other years associated with these winter camps. And so you can see some of them are a little bit more, again, it's that language component. Too, that that is so crucial. Some are easier to, to pinpoint. You can see, uh, I don't know, at first glance, maybe you think that's snow or rain, but this is symbolizing this this meteorite that had taken place. Yeah. December of 23 is when that was adopted. So does this mean um, that museums are going to need to be hiring a lot more people with um, skills in Native American culture and languages? I think it's going to require more connectivity with indigenous peoples. Okay. Um, so for example, I was, I was at a conference just yesterday at the Nebraska Museum Association, mm -hmm. and uh, I was sitting right next to one of the folks from the Pumpa tribe. And during a, a program that, um, a panel that I was, I was in on and listening, he had mentioned specifically uh, that with this new edition of NAGPRA, that museums are to cover up or remove any of these, these culturally questionable items so 
before Orange Hill, they, they reach out or talk to this specific tribe or cultural organization that is affiliated with the object. So I think I, I, it's, it's a right move. I don't think it's gonna, it's going to take more work. But at the same time, and it might lead to more positions in such a, a public history field, but it's going to promote more connectivity to various indigenous. Yeah. But even that won't be enough. Even if they have the people who have the skills, they have to have the immediate contact with the. Yeah. It also depends on like what kind of reporting's on your yeah, collections. Right. right. So. feel very selfish, but I totally understand returning stuff to the people mm -hmm. who belong to it. But then how do I get this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> um, within the boundaries of the native people's framework. So that has been removed from them, that's been taken away from them, um, whether it be the actual children and their bodies and I remains. I totally understand that part, but they don't do museums like we Absolutely, they, they do. do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those are a slowly, and again, every reservation, every tribe is going to have it differently. But um, they're seeking items and collections to promote and use to educate their own future generations of people. So that way, that, that cultural identity isn't lost by time. I was embarrassed one time out at uh, Port Plain. Um, one of the travelers, you know, they came from all over the world. Asked where the Crows were um, Pawnee or uh, Ogallala Museum was. <laughs> Here in yeah. Central Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Go north and west, you'll find them. <laughs> Even right behind you, there's the former curator of the Native American Museum at Crazy Horse Monument. <laughs> Director. <laughs> right behind you, which, is, which is the most magnificent Native American Museum at least in this part of the country, that I have seen. The, the question that comes into play there with regard to individual tribes is the right of sovereignty and storytelling. Yep. And the right to be able to say what of our stories or what of their stories, rather, um, should be told, can be told, what's right to be seen. Um, at Crazy Horse, we took certain measures with, with images of the sun dance in particular, which is a very important <laughs> the key line that, that uh, in that law that dictates is items of museums that receive institutions that receive federal funding. Yep. Because institutions that do not necessarily receive federal funding are not subject to the same rules of reporting. And so thereby um, organizations that may or may not have items by, um, well there's various circumstances
safekeeping that data that it was as well. Uh, did it go out on permanent exhibition? No. It was placed within there for preservation, and so then in special ceremonial and special circumstances, we could serve in the role of preservation, which ultimately one could argue is the goal of a museum, to preserve history. And so I think the better measures that need to be taken are showing where museums can be, can be trusted sources of proper preservation, can work directly with the tribes, as we were making the effort to do in that way, um, and can do so within the bounds that are respectful to the laws in place and respectful to the people that these stories come from. Because ultimately our job is to be storytellers and preserve preservation. Uh, and so we have to say within the realm of museums, what's the appropriate type of story to choose about? Okay. In conjunction with the people. In conjunction with the people. Yeah. I did say I wasn't going to say it. Yeah. <laughs> So again, it's all based on how it was donated. So I know the, that Red Cloud and um, Mr. Cook, the rancher that was out there, they had a great relationship. They were friends. And even then, a lot of Red Cloud's materials were donated to the Cook family and the Cook Ranch, not necessarily acquired under duress or certain means that would be problematic in today's, today's world. Um, and it also depends on the relationship so again, the whole goal of NAGPRA is working with these, these various tribes or these lineal descents that honors and at least brings out some of their interpretations and some of what they want to say in, in these exhibitions or these, these displays or in these museums that have been previously, traditionally, have always been left out. And, and, and quite frankly, um, I think a lot of institutions do okay still those select few that um, have more resources and more power that that resist NAGPRA for whatever reason. Yeah, we'll go Jim. Was the, the stories that uh, came from the media shop, are they any place that we can... They're an oral tradition. So to tell the story, we would have to be in a place where I know they're written down now more and more. Um, again, the year that stars fell, Dr. Campbell Strain and Russell Thornton um, and Emil Plenty Horses, they also, um, they, they, they made a big effort to try to get all of this information out there as much as they can so that way, not only does it get, because we live in a world that's increasingly more and more globalized. And so someone that lives in Washington, D.C. and has been a curator at the Smithsonian may have all these materials, but it's not benefiting the people back in Pine Ridge or people in the Dakota Territory. So it's disseminating this information in a way that people would have access to it on a computer is, is it's an important cultural goal, I would argue. Yeah. Um, I just got a lot of day who recently died in Way to Rainy Mountain, talks a lot about the symbolism of this and relates it to the Kiowa, um, the Kiowa count, so that's a good, literary example of talking about the meaning of the year the star fell. That's just I like. Yeah, good choice. <laughs> I'll take maybe one more question. Linda, did you have one? Well, yes. If a family will donate something to whatever, and then later on someone else in the family doesn't want to donate. Okay, so that's a whole other box of worms. <laughs> <laughs> This is a more culturally sensitive issue. Um, yeah, I'm not in the touch. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, hopefully you enjoyed it. I'm happy to see you.